Now, it's certainly good for a movie to sometimes leave you with something to think about. Perhaps a lingering, unanswered question that's debated and discussed online for years, maybe even decades into the future. Now, there are definitely times when a film's lack of answers or closure can be frustrating, though, especially if you have to wait a long damn time for the concrete truth, whether it's from a sequel, spin off, or simply a belated interview with the cast or crew. And that's what we're talking about today. As I'm Jules, this is WhatCoach.com, and these are 10 movie answers answers given years later. Number 10. Will Scrat ever eat the acorn? Ice Age. Now the question is, is that will Scrat ever eat that damn acorn? Since the very first Ice Age film in 2002, we've observed this saber-toothed squirrel's single-minded pursuit of his precious acorn, which has resulted in the object of his obsession escaping his grasp again and again. But fans who've been watching Scrat with great interest over the last 20 years finally got their wish, though it was certainly in bittersweet fashion. With Ice Age creators Blue Sky Studios having been shut down by Disney last year, the studio's animators teamed up to give both Scrat and the series an affecting final farewell. Blue Sky recently released an unlisted video on YouTube simply called The End, which showed Scrat embracing his beloved acorn once more, looking around and waiting for chaos to ensue, and then gladly devouring the acorn when nothing stopped him. Scrat then seems to consider what emptiness his future might hold with the acorn finally consumed before bouncing off the screen to seek adventure elsewhere. Considering that Scrat is effectively the franchise's mascot, and as proven to be consistently entertaining even as the Ice Age sequels became increasingly dire, it was unexpectedly affecting to see his quest finally fulfilled. Number 9. What happens to Peter after Gwen's death? The Amazing Spider-Man 2 The Amazing Spider-Man franchise was widely expected to be a trilogy in the very least, but after the second film underwhelmed critically and commercially, Sony pumped the brakes on a threequel. And so Andrew Garfield's Peter Parker was left in an unfortunate limbo of sorts, grieving his late girlfriend Gwen Stacy while heading back out into New York City to fight crime. Yet almost a decade removed from his last adventure, what would Peter be up to now? Well, in in addition to an unfathomably popular fan service exercise, Spider-Man's No Way Home's multiverse mechanics allowed Marvel Studios to finally give fans a semblance of closure on Garfield's Part 3. Rather than simply paper over Peter 3's grief and present him as his typically heroic, sarcastic Spider-Man, the film surprisingly lingers on the fact that he's failed to properly move on from Gwen's death, stewing in his misery in a way that impacts both his personal life and his heroism. Peter 3 is driven by anger and depression when we first see him again, though over the course of the film regains a sense of hope by helping the other Spider-Men resolve the multiverse anomaly, and catching a falling MJ as well of course. While some fans are hoping for more MCU adventures starring Peter 3, this is probably best thought of as a neat little epilogue which gave both fans and Garfield himself closure on the character. Number 8. Why does Emmett carry a bag full of eggs? Twilight. So back in 2020, some 12 years after the release of the original Twilight, a clip from the movie went viral on TikTok when one user pointed out that the vampire Emmett could be seen carrying a Ziploc bag of hard-boiled eggs around the cafeteria because of well, reasons. Well, the actor Kellen Lutz clearly got a kick out of the mystery and summarily refused to elaborate more. So it fell to Twilight director Catherine Hardwick to finally spill the beans, and she did so in a frankly hilarious interview with Insider last year. She revealed that Lutz was simply carrying the eggs around on set and she decided to incorporate them into the scene. I saw Kellen carrying a bag of like one dozen hard-boiled eggs and I'm like, what the hell is going on? You're not going to eat like a dozen eggs, are you? I've never seen anybody carry around a Ziploc bag of one dozen eggs and going to eat them all day long. I was just laughing so hard. I'm like, okay, you have to eat those eggs. You have to carry that in that scene because it was just so outrageous. So that was it really, just a super quirky detail that the real actor was doing. Hardwick then added that Kellen was likely carrying around the eggs to supplement his protein intake given the intense regime that he was on to play the hunky vampire. Even so, what a wild ride. Number 7. Where did Luke Skywalker's severed hand go? The Empire Strikes Back The Empire Strikes Back ends with Luke Skywalker having his hand cut off by Darth Vader, losing not only his hand, but his precious lightsaber in the process. For 35 years, the whereabouts of Luke's saber was unknown, though that mystery was cleared up in The Force Awakens when it was found to be in the custody of Maz Kanata. But if Luke's lightsaber was recovered, his hand must have been there too, right? So what the hell happened to it? Well, that hasn't ever been answered in the movies. But but the recent Star Wars Darth Vader comic book finally revealed the truth in its 11th issue, which was released last April some 41 years after Luke's hand was chopped off and dropped through Cloud City Sky to parts unknown. 
The issue, set shortly after Empire, features a scene where Darth Vader visits Palpatine, and as he walks through Palpatine's lab that we saw in The Rise of Skywalker, he chances upon a severed hand floating in what's presumably a Bacta tank. While this hand could theoretically belong to anyone, this just feels too pointed a reference to be anything but Luke's. The wider implications of this are admittedly mind-boggling, with many fans speculating that Luke's DNA could have been used to create Snoke of all people, but that's a whole other kettle of fish. Number 6. What colour is Drax, Guardians of the Galaxy? Now, This might sound ridiculous and self-evident, but seriously, ever since the release of the original Guardians of the Galaxy back in 2014, fans have wondered what Drax the Destroyer's skin colour actually is. Some think that he's green as in the comics, others grey, some blue, and there's never really been an actual, legit consensus on the fact. That is, until James Gunn himself chimed in. Last year, a despairing fan tweeted at Gunn that he and his girlfriend were locked in an unending dispute about Drax's skin colour, to which Gunn mercifully offered the final word, saying, He is grey, but like most grey things, he can take on a blue or green tint under some lights, but he's definitely grey. Gunn elaborated that he decided against giving Drax comic-accurate green skin because Gamora was already green, and green makeup is also the hardest to make resemble real skin. So there it is. Though Drax has basically looked like five different colours amidst the MCU's various elaborate lighting setups, his skin is absolutely, positively grey. Number 5. Who won the third fight between Rocky and Apollo? Rocky 3. So way back in 1982, Rocky 3 ended with Rocky and Apollo Creed having a third and final match to settle things once and for all, though the movie ingeniously ends as the fight begins without revealing the outcome. So who ended up winning? Well, The answer was finally revealed an entire 33 years later in Creed when Apollo's son Adonis asked Rocky about the mythical fight, and Rocky reveals that Apollo was indeed the victor. Now We have to consider the possibility that Rocky was simply showing a little humility and telling Adonis an orphan for God's sake what he probably needed to hear at that point, but from everything the movie tells us, Apollo was far and away the better boxer of the two, with Rocky only barely prevailing in Rocky 2, so it's incredibly easy to take what Rocky tells Adonis as truthful. Number 4. Does the truce last? The Matrix Revolutions now, the third Matrix film ended on a rather weird cliffhanger ending, which really asked more questions than it answered. Beyond Neo's ambiguous fate, a truce is forged between Zion and the machines after Neo agrees to destroy Agent Smith. Yet, the film makes it explicitly clear that this is a deeply uneasy truce, and so the original trilogy wraps up on a not entirely hopeful note, whereby war between the humans and the machines could soon enough kick off again following Smith's demise. But the question is, did it? Well, it took a damn 18 years, but we finally got Got our answer in The Matrix Resurrections. When Neo visits Niobe in the new human underground city, she reveals that the truce did in fact last for many years, and that the architect kept his promises to let anyone who wished to be unplugged from the Matrix do so. The problem, however, is that when enough people became unplugged, the Matrix began to suffer power outages, which ironically caused the machines to start turning on one another and eventually break out into civil war. Further unexpectedly, the situation somewhat eased relations between humans and the machines, as some machines decided to switch sides and join humanity, with bugs revealing that the Sentinels preferred to be called Synthians. So while there's certainly continuing machine conflict in Resurrections, Neo's trip to the machine city in Revolutions had a major, irreversible effect on how the machines viewed humankind. Number 3. What was up with all the Coast Guards? Scooby-Doo 2002's James Gunn penned Scooby-Doo movie may not be as urgently plotted as most, and by that I mean all of the movies on this list, but that doesn't mean that fans haven't been agonizing for a whole 20 years to learn what was up with those damn Coast Guards. During the movie, Mary Jane calls Spooky Island's Coast Guard to report the ancient demons running riot, only for the guard who answers the phone to hang up and start laughing maniacally about the whole situation. Were they just some asshole guards who didn't take their job seriously? Were they paid off to ignore the situation? Or was there something more nefarious at play? Well, the scene's nebulous truth was finally revealed in an interview with the film's editor, who said that the two coast guards were indeed possessed by the demons as many fans had suspected, hence their bizarre reaction to the mayhem unfolding on Spooky Island. Number 2. Who was Falcon talking to? to Ant-Man. So Falcon, played by Anthony Mackie, makes a brief cameo appearance in Ant-Man briefly battling Scott Lang when the pint-sized hero tries to break into the Avengers HQ. 
During the scene, we can hear Falcon talking to an inaudible voice through his radio, telling somebody on the other end, it's really important to me that Cap never finds out about this. Given that we never hear that person on the other end, fans have spent years after the film's 2015 release speculating on who it might be. Now, while Falcon could have conceivably been talking to any random employee of the facility or perhaps a non-superhero like Maria Hill, Ant-Man director Peyton Reed finally put fans out of their misery in 2020 by revealing that Falcon was speaking to none other than Black Widow. When a fan asked Reed about this moment on Twitter, he snappily replied, great question, he's talking to Natasha. The lesson here is that sometimes a burning years old movie question can be categorically answered by just firing a quick tweet at the director. And number one, what happens to Bowman at the end? 2001 A Space Odyssey The end of Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey has been debated and dissected by fans and scholars alike for more than half a century, yet there's seemingly no concrete agreement on precisely what it all means. We can objectively say that the film ends with the good doctor ending up in a large bedroom where he appears to age rapidly until he becomes an old man. A monolith then appears at the foot of his bed, and as he reaches out to it, he's transformed into the star child, which is a floating fetus out in space. But uh, here's the question, what the hell does any of that mean? Well, the theories are myriad, but back in 2018, almost exactly 50 years after 2001's release, an unaired 1980 interview with Kubrick himself was uncovered and published online, with Kubrick offering a surprisingly open and generous explanation of the ending. He said, I've tried to avoid doing this ever since the picture came out. When you just say the ideas, they sound foolish, whereas if they're dramatized, one feels it. But I will try. The idea was supposed to be that he is taken in by godlike entities, creatures of pure energy and intelligence with no shape or form. They put him in what I suppose you could describe as a human zoo to study him, and his whole life passes from that point on in that room. And he has no sense of time, it just seems to happen as it does in the film. When they get finished with him, as happens in so many myths of all cultures in the world, he is transformed into some kind of super being and sent back to Earth, transformed and made into some sort of Superman. We have to only guess what happens when he goes back. It's this pattern of a great deal of mythology, and that's what we are trying to suggest. While Kubrick certainly doesn't give an entirely concrete account of the ending, and audiences are free to retain their own interpretations, it is fascinating to hear from the enigmatic filmmaker's own mouth what he was going for. And there we go, my friends. Those were 10 movie answers given years later. I hope that you enjoyed that, and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below. As always, I've been Jules. You can go follow me over on Twitter at RetroJ, but the O is a zero, or you can swing by Live and Let's Dice, where I do all of my streaming and Warhammer Battle reports outside of work, and it'd be great to see you over there. And I'll speak to you soon. Bye.